mistake. This is not a new law. This is a policy decision by the current um, administration. Um, secondly, it's not an amnesty. And I've heard a lot in the media with people calling this an amnesty, and it's not an amnesty. And secondly, it does not provide any type of permanent uh, status for people. Um, and my colleague uh, Jack Brockers is going to be speaking in more detail about what you need to do to qualify for this. But what this new policy does is it gives people a, a two-year uh, uh, grace period, a two-year window, where they will not be um, removed from the country. And during that period of time, um, they can get a work permit, which of course, as we know, will probably mean that they can also get a driver's license. Um, so there are a lot of benefits to it. Um, now, I've, <laughs> I've been doing this a couple of times. We've had a lot of trouble with um, translating some of the basic terms from English into Spanish because the terms don't make any sense in English. They really don't. Like, what is the term prosecutorial discretion? No clue. So when people, and I'll, I think it's good then to, to back up and explain what this policy is then and how it came about because deferred action is part of a broader policy under the broader umbrella of prosecutorial discretion. In other words, the discretion of the prosecutor, which in this case is immigration and customs. So when we say prosecutorial discretion, what it means is that the government is making a decision on a case-by-case -case basis not to put someone into deportation proceedings or for someone who's in deportation proceedings to take them out of, uh, of deportation proceedings. And we've seen over the past two years or so um, the policy of prosecutorial discretion being carried out in uh, in various ways. And Jack and I and some of the other attorneys on the panel would be happy to answer more questions in detail. But this is, you know, going to be evaluated on a case-by-case um, -case basis. And it's very important for um, for people to keep that in mind. Now, having said that, there are two different paths to get uh, deferred action at the The first path is for people who are already in deportation proceedings. So if you have a hearing in the immigration court coming up, or you had a hearing in the immigration court in the past, and you were ordered removed and you haven't left yet, or you know you've been picked up by ICE and you haven't gone to court for the first time, or you've taken voluntary departure and you haven't left. In all those cases, in all those cases, you can apply for deferred action now. Okay, did I, have I lost everybody? Okay. Now, anybody else, if you've never been in removal proceedings, you've never been in deportation proceedings, don't do anything now. Okay, that's very important because there's a lot of um, um, notarios um, and uh, attorneys who are less than honest who are promising people that if they come into the office now and pay them lots of money, they can help them. Um, and that's totally untrue. Um, until August 15th, there's nothing you can do proactively, there's nothing you can do to start the process um, until the firm, uh, firm guidelines come. So, um, and if, I'm going to turn it over to Jack, who's going to talk about what you can do to qualify. But the most important thing to remember is for now, you know, unless you're already in deportation proceedings, you cannot apply for deferred um, action. Six requirements to be eligible for deferred action. And you have to meet all six requirements to be eligible. The first requirement is to have arrived in the United States under the age of 16. Okay. The second requirement is to have continuously resided in the United States for at least five years prior to June 15, 2012. So effectively, to have resided continuously in the United States 
from June 15, 2007 until June 15, 2012. Now, you may ask yourself, what if I had a brief absence outside of the country during that time? What USCIS, um, the Citizenship and Immigration Service, has told us um, is that a brief absence for humanitarian purposes will not make you ineligible um, under this requirement. So, you know, you may, th that raises questions whether if you did have a brief absence, will you meet this requirement? How do you show it's for humanitarian purposes? Um, you know, that, that's a good question to have. Uh, another part of that requirement is that you were present in the United States on June 15, 2012. So that's part and parcel of that requirement. The third requirement um, is that to apply for this, you have to be 15 years old. Um, now, it is our understanding that ap people who would um, qualify, who are 14 right now, will be able to apply when they're 15. Okay, or if they're 13 right now, they will be able to age into this requirement and apply when they're 15. Um, the fourth requirement is that you were under 31 years old on June 15, 2012. So that's the magic date, June 15, 2012. You had to be under 31 years old. Okay. Um, now the the two requirements that are the, the stickiest. You have to currently be in school, have graduated from high school, have attain, obtained a GED, a General Educational Development Certificate, or be an honorably discharged veteran of the Coast Guard or Armed Forces of the United States. Um, there are some questions as to what if you came to the United States, you meet all the other requirements, you were in high school for a short time, and then you dropped out, and you never got a diploma. Or what if you never went to high school? Um, can you go back to school right now? Um, can you enroll in a GED program, or some other type of continuing education? We're, our advice is to enroll in those programs now, um, but we don't know what the final rule is going to be, whether that's going to qualify you under these requirements. Um, but obviously, you know, it's, um, or at least my own personal opinion, I shouldn't say our opinion, my own personal opinion is, you know, worst case scenario, um, you're furthering your education. Now, the, the last requirement is that you have not been convicted of a felony offense, of a significant misdemeanor offense, or three or more non-significant misdemeanors. Okay. Now, a felony offense is uh, defined by statute. But what is a significant misdemeanor offense? Well. Citizenship and Immigration Service has given us an idea of what they're going to qualify as a significant misdemeanor offense. Um, driving under the influence, possession of a controlled substance such as marijuana, obstruction of justice, a crime of violence such as assault, um, or a theft offense. Um, moreover, part of this requirement is that you cannot be, you cannot pose a threat to national security or public safety. Oh, wait, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Um, there's also, you can have three or more non-significant misdemeanors. In North Carolina, driving without a license is a misdemeanor. So if you had three driving without a license, you would not be eligible. Um, now, Mr. McAlpin is a criminal, ex criminal law expert, and he's going to talk more about what are misdemeanors under North Carolina law. Um, okay, so 
the last part of that requirement, you cannot pose a threat to national security or public safety. Okay. Citizenship and Immigration Service has told us in a question and answer that they have on their website that to determine whether a person presents a threat to public safety, they're looking at things like juvenile delinquency adjudications, um, any connections with gang activity, or any action where the police stopped you and asked questions about gangs or gang membership, um, and also arrests um, and criminal charges that have been dismissed in court. Um, they'll be looking at all of that to determine if someone is a public safety threat. What about a national security threat? Um, what we've been told is um, participation in activities that threaten the United States. So we, you know, this is something that is very broad that we don't exactly know the contours of right now. Um, so just to finish up, those are the six requirements. Now it's one thing to know that you qualify because you meet all six requirements. It's a totally different thing to be able to prove it. Okay, so you're gonna need to gather proof. Um, and we have um, someone here today from the Wake County School Board, um, or Wake County School System. Um, Mr. McCoppin, we're going to talk about how you can gather documents. Um, the types of documents you're going to be needing to gather are your birth certificate or passport to show when you were born, school documents um, such as grades, uh, I'm sorry, report cards, transcripts, um, to your diploma, um, medical documents, vaccination records, um, employment documents, driving records other types of documents um, to meet the requirements. So while you can't apply now, you can start gathering those documents together to be ready. Um, and so that that's all I wanted to say right now about the requirements. And now Marty Rosenbluth is going to talk a little bit more about the risks and benefits. So. I mean, the benefit, everyone's really clear on what the benefits of this are. You get, uh, and again, deferred action means that the government is not going to deport you for two years. That's what it means in this, uh, in this context. So that's benefit number one. Benefit number two is that you get a work permit for two years. And our understanding is that that's supposed to be renewable. That at the end of the two years, you should be able to apply to have that renewed um, again. And um, one of the benefits that I think is you know, most significant for a lot of people is that you can actually get a driver's license, um, which is huge. Um, because as we know, currently in North Carolina, anybody who's here without the proper papers cannot get a driver's license. Um, and that has just opened up the door for um, massive um, racial profiling on the part of uh, local law enforcement. Um, commonly known as driving while Latino um, or driving while brown. Um, the burdens are a little bit hard to, uh, to weigh at the moment. And these are really the questions that when I've done these in the past that people um, want to know. Um, people have asked, well, what if I apply and I'm um, denied? Um, will I end up in deportation proceedings? And people have also said, well, if I apply, will that expose um, my family to deportation proceedings? Because by applying, if I have to put down, you know, on the application, you know, what other family members are here, does that expose my um, family? And to date, Actually, I'll let the um, uh, spokesperson for the um, CISS answer this question as well. But to date, what they're saying is that no, it does not. Um, it does not put your your family at risk. And they there's actually a nine-page memo. Lawyers love documents. Lawyers love long memos. So when we asked this question of of CIS, they pointed us to this nine-page memo, which explained in great detail what CIS's policy is going to be in terms of putting people into um, removal proceedings. 
But for now, our understanding is it does not put people's families um, at risk at this point. Um, so again, just to um, um, wrap things up a little bit, don't, you cannot apply now if you're not in removal proceedings, although as Jack was saying, there's a lot of different documents that you can start gathering now, and that's actually a really good idea to start putting together the um, documents. Don't apply through a uh, notario, and if anybody wants to charge you money to start the process now, hold off until um, at least August 15th when the guidelines, um, when the guidelines are. And I'm gonna turn the microphone over to um, Mr. McCock. Thank you. Uh, my name is Andrew Carpenter. I wanted to talk a little bit about whether your criminal history qualifies you for application. The first thing you have to do is determine have you been convicted of crime. Many people can remember, tell their lawyer, and make a judgment. Sometimes it's hard to remember when you need to get a criminal history. There are different ways to get criminal history records. <coughs> and some are more complete than others. Any of you can go to a county courthouse and check your record in that county for $25. But it's often incorrect or incomplete. You can also go to your local jail and give them your fingerprints for a record check. Please do not do that. The local jail will take down your information, your photograph, your family's information and keep it in their local database. You don't want them having that information. A lawyer can have your fingerprints taken and send a special request to the government asking for a record check. The federal government says they are not using that information for immigration purposes. The easiest way to start to see someone like me to go down to the courthouse and look you up in the public access terminal. That allows us to look through all of North Carolina's criminal convictions and try to locate any that apply to you. Sometimes it's difficult because the officer may switch your last name or spell it incorrectly or enter the wrong birthday. Later this evening, we can do a partial criminal search in the back of the room. There's no rush. We'll stay, we'll stay as late as we need to to help everyone who would like to help. We can get you a more thorough search at the local courthouse. If that initial search suggests that you are probably eligible, that means you have no felony convictions, no serious misdemeanor convictions, and only one or two minor convictions. Only then do we request an official record from the federal government. It's important to talk to your immigration attorney about doing that record search so that you don't give your information to local law enforcement. Some people will be ineligible to apply because they have a felony conviction. Some people will be eligible because they have a perfectly clean criminal record. Other people might qualify. What that means is you may have three minor misdemeanor convictions. Today that disqualifies you. But if I or a lawyer like me goes back to the court and reopens one of those cases and has the judgment modified so it is no longer a minor misdemeanor conviction or even a serious misdemeanor conviction, we might be able to adjust your criminal history to make you eligible. Also, if you have a new criminal charge, it's important to resolve it in a way that does not disqualify you. Or if you have older criminal charges that you've never resolved, 
Perhaps you were charged or arrested, but never went to court to complete the case. That unfinished case will disqualify you from application. It's very important that when you're ready to go back and resolve it, to finish it, that you do it in a way that keeps you eligible. I'll be available after this session to speak with anyone who has questions, but my goal is to help you know that you're eligible or tell you what we can do to hopefully make you eligible for application. Um, we're going to start taking fingerprints at our office in the next few weeks so that if you need a private attorney to request your federal records, you can do that without worrying about giving your information to the local jail. We don't plan to charge for that, just whatever it costs for the application fee. Thank you for listening, and we'll be available later this evening.